Well, good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today, and welcome to the Cato Institute. Uh, my name is Will Wilkinson. I'm a policy analyst here at the Institute and managing editor of Cato Unbound, our <coughs> monthly online magazine of ideas. We're here to discuss Brian Kaplan's new book, uh, The Myth of the Rational Voter, Why Democracies Choose Bad Policies. Uh, you'll be able to find the book uh, conveniently for purchase in the lobby, and Brian will uh, graciously uh, sign your copy uh, if uh, you so desire. Uh, now, Brian's book, The Myth of uh, the Rational Voter, has emerged as one of the most important works of the current season, receiving reviews in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, The Economist, and The New Yorker, among other prominent and prestigious publications. Uh, why all of this uh, lavish attention on what might otherwise seem like a somewhat uh, abstract work of uh, political economy? Well, uh, to give it uh, my shot, I think there's about three reasons, maybe more. Brian will uh, uh, hazard his own guesses, I'm sure. Um, first, uh, it's just because it's a truly important book. Uh, this is a first-rate contribution to political economy in the public choice tradition of Anthony Downs, James Buchanan, and Gordon Tullock. Second, because it is lucidly written and forcefully argued. And it's a real pleasure to read. Uh, third, and not least, if you are one of those people for whom democracy inspires a kind of religious reverence, then Brian's argument may sound like dangerous blasphemy. I think that has uh, provoked quite a bit of comment. Uh, but dangerous blasphemers need not be crazed visionaries. They can also be happy rationalists, which makes them even harder to dismiss. As uh, Louis Menand notes in his New Yorker review, Brian seems to blithely plow through democratic pieties. Quote, Kaplan is the sort of economist, are there other kinds? There must be, who engages with the views of non-economists in the way a bulldozer would engage with a picket fence if a bulldozer could express glee. <laughs> well, if you know Brian, uh, as uh, I have the good fortune to, the image of a happy bulldozer is, in fact, delightfully apt, I think. As Brian notes in his book, the, con the conversation about the merits and demerits of democracy uh, is often cut short by uh, would-be wits wielding uh, a famous Winston Churchill quotation. Uh, Churchill is supposed to have said, and I quote, democracy is the worst form of government except for all those other forms that have been tried from time to time. Uh, now, I'm sure we can all largely agree on that, and I, I doubt that there are any of us here who really long to be ruled by a king or would really like to see where a series of five-year plans would get us or uh, would like to give good old-fashioned, you know, blood and soil fascism a you know, a real try, we like democracy uh, just fine. Uh, but Churchill's bon mot shouldn't cut the conversation short since democracy is a very, very general idea and can be implemented in very many different ways with dramatically different consequences. Uh, if you were to ask me, I would tell you that mammals make the best pets. Um, but if you're shopping for your seven-year-old daughter, you shouldn't be indifferent between a kitten and a badger. To concede that democracy is the best thing going doesn't tell us what kind of democracy we want. Uh, for example, it doesn't tell us what the scope of democratic decision making should be. Should we vote for a national toothpaste? Uh, sh if, we have represent if we have representatives, what should be uh, the domain of things that they get to vote about? Gladly, the American Constitution says that Congress can't vote to rescind our rights to free speech or to bear arms. Uh, and whether or not we you know, have to quarter troops is apparently beyond the democratic pale. Uh, the desirable scope of democratic decision making depends on a lot of things. And one of the most important things is the quality of democratic decisions. If voters don't know what they're doing and support policies and politicians uh, for silly, arbitrary, or purely emotional reasons, we may end up with policies that make us all worse off, that produce results that none of us really wanted. It may be, in that case, best to limit the scope of democratic choice to make room for the free reign of other mechanisms, such as the market, less likely to run roughshod over our freedoms and more likely to produce good results. 
The myth of rational, the rational voter is, in my opinion, one of the most persuasive arguments that I've ever read for relying less on government and more on markets. So I am delighted that Brian Kaplan is here today at Cato to lay out the contours of his argument and to tell us about his book. So let me uh, introduce Brian properly to you. Here is Brian Kaplan, who is an associate professor of economics at George Mason University and an adjunct scholar here at the Cato Institute. He's published in a number of prominent academic journals, including the American Economic Review, Public Choice, the Journal of Law and Economics, and more. He received his BS in economics from the University of California, Berkeley, and his PhD from Princeton University. After Brian's remarks, uh, we'll have comments from Scott Keeter of the uh, Pew Research Foundation, and I will, uh, uh, I will uh, introduce him properly just before his comments. For now, help me to welcome Brian Kaplan. Uh, thank you very much, Will. Now, when looking at my book, you might initially think that I'm not saying anything that everybody doesn't already know. Uh, the view that voters know extremely little about politics and economics is actually standard in political science. Uh, Scott Keeter has a very good book on the subject, uh, What Americans Know About Politics and Why It Matters, uh, which reviews an entire literature uh, uh, producing the consensus that actually voters know very little about politics and economics. However, uh, there are also very many people in social science who will add, yes, it's true that the voters don't know very much about these subjects, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't make any difference in the end which seems like a very strange thing to say. If you were to say that your brain surgeon doesn't know anything about brain surgery, but it doesn't matter, you'd say, what do you mean? How could it possibly not matter that your brain surgeon doesn't know anything about the brain? And yet there is an answer which uh, is internally consistent uh, that has been offered, and the answer is known as the miracle of aggregation. All right? uh, the idea here is that as long as voters' errors are completely random, as long as there's no pattern in the errors, as long as people basically make a mistake by flipping a coin, as long as that is how it works, then basic statistics tells us that their errors will tend to cancel out. As long as there's a reasonably large number of voters, and as long as their errors look like the flip of a coin, then in the end you're just going to get a result that averages out, and the average opinion is going to make a lot of sense, even though individuals actually seem to know uh, very little. And now, incidentally, if you, uh, you know, while, while social scientists often talk about the miracle of aggregation, a uh, popular audience is much more likely to know this argument as the wisdom of crowds argument from James Sirwiki, or this is really an application of the wisdom of crowds. But uh, again, the idea in the book is exactly the same one that I'm telling you, saying that uh, it is a statistical rule that random errors will balance out, and therefore it's quite possible for a group where individuals don't seem to know very much to act as if it knew a great deal. So, according to the miracle aggregation, it's possible for a highly uninformed electorate to act as if it were fully, fully informed. For example, you could take a question like free trade versus protection. Right? Well, as long as for every person who underestimates the benefits of free trade, there's another person who overestimates the, overestimates the, overestimates the benefits, then the actual average view is going to be correct. And the fact that people don't seem to know very much, or the fact that if you were to go and chat with people while they're standing in line to vote, and you talk to 99 people, and 99 of them seem to not know what's going on, well, really what matters is that 100th person who winds up swaying, who winds up swaying the outcome. All right. Now, the interesting thing about the miracle of aggregation is it basically gives people a way to believe in the facts and democracy at the same time. All right, just like walking and chewing gum at the same time, uh, the, uh, the, the miracle of aggregation allows a person to first admit the facts, which are very hard to deny that the typical American does not know a great deal about politics, does not know a great deal about economics, and yet it gives them a story for why that doesn't matter. It gives them a story for why you can say you can expect a group of people, most of whom know little or nothing, to actually yield an outcome that is about as good as you could hope for. Right, so it's really quite an argument. Uh, I often refer to this as an alchemist recipe. So you take 99 parts lead, one part gold, mix it around, and then you pour it out, and it's gold in the end, right? which uh, seems like magic. But the miracle aggregation is not magic. It is, it is, a, val it is a valid argument right, uh, in the logical sense, namely that the conclusion does fall from the premises. Uh, there's just one problem. Is this premise actually correct? Is the premise that all errors are random and completely unpredictable actually true? Uh, well, this is where I like to bring up the old saying, if it seems too good to be true, it probably is. If it seems too good to be true to say that a democracy where virtually no one knows what they're doing can still produce perfectly good results, or in fact can produce results that are as good as if everyone knew exactly what they were doing, 
Uh, that seems like a very, very, very strong argument, and it's the kind of thing where you might want to exert some skepticism and uh, poke around to the roots of the story. Uh, just like if you're watching late night TV and you see something about how you too can get rich in real estate, uh, you should probably be careful about that, because it is you don't need any education, no money down, no thing. If that's really true, then why isn't everyone doing it? You know, because their families have deterred them. Uh, I don't think so. It seems more likely that this plan uh, might work uh, in, you know, under some very rare circumstances, but probably actually is not all that it's cracked up to be. If it seems too good to be true, then it probably is. Okay, so this key assumption behind the miracle aggregation is that voter errors are random rather than systematic. And what evidence is there empirically to actually support this assumption? Turns out there's very little. Most of the time when people appeal to this assumption, they just will make an argument by analogy. They'll say, well, look, you know, if you're flipping coins, then it's, th then it's all going to balance out, and therefore the same thing's going to happen in politics. You say, you know, that's not a very convincing argument. I'd like to actually have some evidence. It seems in particular like this is an important enough issue that you don't want to just say, I'm going to sit in my room and think about what makes sense to me. You might want to actually go to the numbers and see whether what makes sense to you actually really does make sense. All right now, when you turn to public opinion data, it turns out that you don't have to look very hard. Large systematic errors are the rule, not the exception. You can find large systematic errors in almost any area of politics or economics, almost any politically interesting area. And you can find them through a number of different methods, all of which basically point in the same conclusion. Now, there are several different approaches. The one that is least controversial is simply comparing public opinion to actual hard numbers. So for example, if you're looking at public opinion about the budget, well, on the one hand, we can ask people, what do you think, how much money do you think we spend on foreign aid? Then we can go over to the actual numbers in the budget and find out how much we really do spend on foreign aid. And then we can see whether the average answer to the public is correct. Uh, as you may guess, it is not. It is off by many, many times. Uh, in fact, there was a very interesting 1995 survey. Turned out that foreign aid was the, was, you know, when people were asked to name the two largest components of the budget, foreign aid was the most frequently named, even though it's about 1% of the budget. And on the other hand, Social Security was way down the list when it actually is the largest component of the budget. Okay, so that is one approach. Uh, there are some others, however. The main problem with, this, with the purely uh, quantitative approach is there's a lot of interesting questions that are too ambiguous to do, the, to do that. There isn't any official manual where you can flip it, uh, uh, flip it open and see what, what is the correct answer to the question, what trade policy maximizes uh, na national well-being. Right? Uh, there is, uh, this isn't to say that there's not a correct answer to it, but it's too ambiguous uh, to simply put into the statistical abstract of the United States. Right? So what can you do in this case? Uh, there's a couple of different approaches. The one that I rely on, though, is comparison between laymen and experts. So what I do is I rely upon the assumption, which many people may find unpleasantly elitist, but note I'm only saying pres a presumption, I'm not saying a fact, I'm saying a presumption, that when experts and laymen disagree, the experts are right and the public is wrong. Uh, again, I'm not saying this is always true or absolutely true or necessarily true. I'm just saying it is a reasonably st reasonable starting point. And if someone objects to a specific application of the starting point, I'd like to hear some specific reasons why they don't like it. Because in general, if you hear an argument between any, between any two people, say about whether, what's wrong with their car, right? If there's one guy who knows a lot about cars and he says there's a problem, you don't know a lot about cars and you think something else, who does smart money bet on? Smart money bets on the person who actually studied the subject extensively. All right, so my main approach then is to use this presumption that when laymen and experts disagree, the experts are right and laymen are wrong. Now, my main focus is beliefs about economics. Why, do, why, why economics? Well, uh, two big reasons. First of all, economics is so intertwined with modern policy that almost every question in politics is now in part an economics question. And so economics is extremely important to modern policy. And in fact, if you take a look at what people say is, or what issues people say are the most important ones to them, economics has, has historically almost always been at the top of the list. Uh, since 9-11, uh, terrorism foreign policy has sometimes supplanted economics. But also, if you uh, count borderline cases, like is welfare policy or environmental policy, is that economics? Then the case for economics being the number one issue or, cat or issue that people care about is very strong. Right? So that's one reason, is just that economics is ubiquitous in modern policy. Second of all, though, is there's an interesting pattern uh, historically, which is that economists have spent several centuries complaining about the public's economic literacy. Economists have spent several century, centuries saying, I can't believe the public really thinks these things. I try and try to explain why, why, why they're an error, but they just don't listen. Right? Or they complain, my students show up and you won't believe the kind of nonsense they believe. And here's what I'm trying to, to, to teach them out of. Okay, so economists have had these complaints for a very long time, so at least suggests that this is an area to start looking for where well, maybe some important systematic errors exist. Again, maybe it won't be so, but at least it's a natural starting point.
Right now, my strategy in the book, in large part, is to, com is to use a survey called the Survey of Americans and Economists on the Economy, originally done by the Kaiser Family Foundation in 1996. This is the only survey out there that deliberately asks exactly the same questions about how the economy works to economists and to non-economists. So you're able to actually get an apples-to-apples -apples comparison, as you weren't able to get from previous surveys. Right? And uh, you know, you know, at first pass, if you take a look at the results, do the average beliefs of economists and the public uh, line up? Do, on average, do they agree? And the answer is absolutely not. They very radically disagree. They see the world almost in two completely different pictures. Right? There, so there are these large belief gaps between economists and non-economists. And furthermore, the gaps are basically in the directions that economists would have expected all along. So in other words, all the complaining that economists have been doing for a couple centuries come out very nicely in the data. You can actually see the numbers back up what economists have been saying based upon their firsthand experience. Right, so perhaps not too surprising, but on the other hand, some people have questioned economists' social intelligence. So, uh, so it turns out at least that when students have been saying that, uh, they're very con that they're concerned that imports are destroying our country, that economists have uh, correctly heard them that this is actually their concern. Right now, there are four main patterns of belief gaps that I, dis that I discuss in the book. Uh, just to go over them very quickly, uh, the, 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 probably the biggest one of all, or the overarching one, is what I call anti-market bias. This is a strong tendency on the part of the public to underestimate the social benefits of the market mechanism, basically to look at intentions instead of outcomes. And so non-economists, when they're trying to figure out, is the system going to be good for society, ask, what do the people who are doing this want? Are they, are they selfless and, and socially concerned, or are they greedy and selfish? Right now, economists have spent a very long time saying, you know what, that really doesn't matter. It's quite possible that a person could be selfish and greedy and still lead to very socially beneficial outcomes. How so? Well, suppose the way to get rich is to make the customer happy. In fact, that is a very common circumstance. If, so, if, if someone says, here's my business plan, I figured out how I'm going to get rich, and in, in step one, make the customer hate me. Uh, not a very good business plan in general. Again, you might try it if you're going to do a, sc a scam. You'll set up a shop for one day, cheat everyone out of their money, and run away. Uh, there are a few stories like this on The Sopranos. But uh, this, is, this, is the this is obviously the exception, not the rule. If someone said that my business plan is to make sure that every customer walks away unhappy, uh, you would say, you know, I think that maybe being in business is not for you. That's not actually how it really works. So anti-market bias, tendency to underestimate the social benefits of the market mechanism, very common. And also closely related to this is the public's failure to appreciate the importance of competition in making pleasing the customer in the self-interest of business. So uh, you know, there is a very common view among the public that prices are set in back, room, in back hotel rooms by five guys smoking cigars. And uh, this, this is a, a, view, a view that is extremely widespread, uh, although uh, often people, t people will exempt their own industry. Well, my own industry is very competitive, of course, but all the other, uh, other ones that I don't actually have any knowledge of, I'm sure that prices there are not set competitively. Right? So again, this is a story that economists have found very implausible when you consider especially how many people would have to be involved in this conspiracy, and uh, what are the possibilities of new entry, and so on. All right, so anti-market bias is, overarch is the early the overarching one where economists and the public have long disagreed. Uh, second one, one where even people who, are, who have some appreciation of the market mechanism will often fly off the handle is what I call anti-market bias, or excuse me, anti-foreign bias. Generally, people get especially outraged and, and worried when foreigners enter the picture. All right, so it's one thing to say that, it's, that there can be mutually beneficial trade between two Americans. But to say there can be mutually beneficial trade between Americans and Chinese, you know, that's crazy talk. Right? Uh, there, there is a, a widespread perception among the public that when foreigners are involved, that something bad is going to happen. And here again, economists have spent many centuries saying, no, actually, the basic principle that trade benefits both sides remains true. And furthermore, uh, there is actually a very interesting economic point, which said, uh, economic principle called the law of comparative advantage, which says that even when one country is more productive in every way than, the tra than its trading partner, mutually beneficial trade is still possible. Classic example, suppose that, the, that there's, you have a guy who's the world's best brain surgeon and the world's fastest typist. Does it make sense for him to hire a secretary? Obviously it does, because if he hires someone to do his typing, then even though that person will not be as good at typing, the world's best brain surgeon will then be able to fo focus on his brain surgery. Similarly, if the U.S. is more productive than Mexico in both manufacturing and agriculture, this means that uh, as long as, if the U.S. is even more better in manufacturing than agriculture, the U.S. can specialize in manufacturing and basically outsource agriculture to Mexico, uh, leading to an increase in the world's output. And so just because foreigners are involved does not mean you should expect bad outcomes, uh, quite the contrary. Uh, make work bias, a uh, tendency to judge the, uh, judge the performance of an economy by employment rather than production. And, uh, again, a very common view. If you, if you go back to what the economy looked like 100 years ago, in terms of employment, people were doing much better than they are today. 
There was no problem. People were working very large number of, numbers of hours 100 years ago, right? There, there's barely a free moment in the day. So by that standard, you might say they were better off than we are today. However, there's one way in which people 100 years ago are much worse off than, than, than we are today, and that is stuff. We have a lot of stuff that they don't have, right? We have free time. We have all these amazing products. We have iPhones, so on, things they couldn't even imagine. And, what, and well, how is this possible? In large part, because we didn't try to save jobs 100 years ago. We decided to let the machine put farmers out of business so they could go and do something else instead. And what were those other things that people were going to do instead? Someone asked you that at the time, you'd have to say, I don't know. You certainly weren't going to say the iPhone is what they're going to do 100 years ago. You had no, all you could say is, well, they're going to do something, I don't know what it is, which sounds like a cop-out, but no, it's actually a very sensible admission of the fact that you don't know what's going to happen, but you do know that, so, that la the valuable labor is going to be put to good use if uh, markets are allowed to work. Right, and last quick pattern to mention, uh, what I call pessimistic bias. It's basically a tendency to see the world going to hell in a handbasket, to think that things are bad right now, they've been getting worse, and they're going to get even worse in the future. It's the kind of thing that's very, a very common view among non-economists, and economists will say that is really pretty, str pretty strange view. If you just compare what things were like in 1980 to what they're like today, can't you see the improvements? Can't you see them? Right, now, at this point, I'm old enough to that I actually can say I've seen the improvements, and I am shocked that anyone disputes it. So, but uh, again, uh, of course, uh, my shock is uh, precisely what's partly motivated the book. All right, now, uh, coming back to this question of couldn't the experts be the ones who are biased? I only said it's a presumption that when laymen and experts disagree, the experts are right, the laymen are wrong. I don't want to be dogmatic about it. I don't want to say that experts have the truth. You must listen. You will do what you're told. I, I, that, I, I, there are some experts out there that I have some questions about myself. Uh, but what I would like to ask for is, look, if you think that the experts are biased and that the presumption is wrong, at least tell me why. Give me a story. And here there are actually two big stories about why economists cannot be trusted. Uh, the first story is known as self-serving bias. This basically says, look, economists, the rich, a lot of them have tenure, although not all economists. Uh, some of them are hanging on by thread. But, <laughs> but uh, economists are rich. They've got tenure. They have, all the, they, they have these great lives. Of course they think everything's fine. Of course they think markets work. It's, no, it's easy to think that markets work when, you, when you're an economist because markets are working for you. Right. So uh, the, the complaint then is the economists imagine that what is good for them is good for the country. Well, uh, that's one story that's been told. An another story that's often been told is what I call, what I call ideological bias. A story that economists are just a bunch of right-wing ideologues, and they, have a, and, and they have basically made people who do not agree with them so uncomfortable in the economics profession that they don't want to join. Right. So, <laughs> all right, another story. Okay. And again, this is one where if you hang out at George Mason University, you might say there's a kernel of truth in this. Um, but, uh, yes, it turns out that both, neither of these stories actually can, uh, can stand up against the data because here's the problem. Once you give a specific explanation for what's wrong with economists, then we can get the numbers and we can test it. And the survey that I have do, uh, does actually have these numbers. It has measures of income, measures of job security, measures of income growth, measures of party, measures of, party measures of ideology, and many other variables. So uh, if you were to go and do some, a standard statistical procedure, which if you saw Steve Levitt on The Daily Show back when he was first promoting Freakonomics, Levitt asked him, how is it that you sort out the relative effects of different things on crime? And Levitt said, well, use multiple regression analysis. And, Levitt, and, and, uh, and John Stewart says, that's one of my favorite kinds of analysis. <laughs> so, so yes, well, it's one of my favorite kinds of analysis too. And that is basically what I did, what I did in the book and in uh, some previous papers is say, look, let's go and just try to do an apples to apples comparison. Let's use statistics to simulate what would the typical economist think if you made him drive a taxi cab? Would he change his mind? Or alternately, what would the typical taxi cab driver think if you went and sent him to econ grad school but, didn't let him, but forced him to continue being a taxi cab driver? Right? Uh, it turns out that there'd be very little change in economists' beliefs if you did this. Uh, in fact, uh, and basically what's going on is that economists who are rich and have, and have a lot of job security still very deeply disagree with non-economists who are rich and have, a lot, and have a lot of job security. So compare the typical economist to Bill Gates, you should expect statistically that actually Gates will still think things that are very different from what most economists think. Right? Even, though, even though Gates also lives a very pleasant lifestyle, even more ple pleasant than some economists, from what I've heard. <laughs> uh, nevertheless, uh, his pleasant lifestyle has not been enough to, 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 uh, to turn people like him. I mean, again, possibly Bill, possibly Bill Gates does think like an economist, I don't know. But people like Bill Gates, uh, as a rule, uh, do not think especially like an economist. Essentially controlling for all these self-serving variables at most uh, shears off about 20% of the belief gap, and even that's probably an overstatement. Now, when you go over to ideological bias, if you know anything about the facts, you immediately realize the story cannot possibly work. Why is that? Because the typical economist is a moderate Democrat. 
The typical economist is a moderate Democrat. He's a moderate Democrat who thinks that supply and demand determines prices, that downsizing is good for the economy, that free trade is good for the economy, and so on. Uh, so in fact, uh, when you go and add statistical controls for party and ideology, the gap gets bigger. Because you, you, you have liberal democratic economists holding views that are completely bizarre for the typical liberal Democrat. And a way that I like to think about this is if you were to go and implement all political reforms where the Cato Institute and the typical liberal Democrat can agree on, you would have more reform than you've gotten in 30 years. It would be an amazing change because there's so many things that Cato, that the Cato advocates that while not acceptable to the typical American, make perfect sense to the typical economist, including the typical liberal democratic economist, will say, you know, I'm a liberal democrat, but that doesn't mean that I'm not an economist, and these ideas simply make sense. All right. Now, last question that, uh, that I want to address here is one that uh, concerns me quite a, bit, quite a bit in the book, which is why is the people would be rational some of the time and irrational other times? So what I've noticed is uh, people who have a very poor grasp of economics, not only do they have a poor grasp, but have an angry poor grasp. People who have never studied the subject, have strong opinions anyway, and if you, with your many years in the field, offer, however politely, some criticism of their views, will lash out at you, get very upset. Right, so what exactly is going on here? Why is the people who, in their ordinary lives, are perfectly reasonable, hold down a job, maybe are even extremely successful in their jobs, still will not listen to reason when it comes to a subject like this? And again, you know, not, you know, not, not to say that uh, I am the voice of reason, but won't even you know, engage in the, in the very minimal acts of intellectual discipline of taking a deep breath, calming down, at least trying to listen to what someone else has to say. Right, so what's going on here? Uh, an answer that I pursue at length in the book is say, really we should think about irrationality as being a good like any other. And why would you want the good of irrationality? Well, the nice thing about irrationality is it allows you to protect your views from criticism. If there's some views that are important to you that give meaning to your life, and you don't want to stop believing them because you want your life to have meaning, well, uh, it's very dangerous to be, to, be, to, be, to be constantly open to logic and facts, because basically every day you are risking your beliefs. Every day you're risking your worldview, you're risking being stripped of all your illusions. On the other hand, if logic and facts mean nothing to you, if, you, if you're irrational about a subject, you're safe. You're safe. No one can change your mind if you are, op if you are completely close to, to logic and facts. Right? So, it is, so you, know, you might want to be close to those as, uh, in order to make sure that you don't have to change your mind, in, uh, in order to make sure that views that give meaning to your lives actually st uh, uh, stay with you. Right? So the story that I tell then is that when an individual pays little price for rationality, and uh, politics is a prime example, you could have completely crazy views and vote on the basis of them, and what's going to happen to you personally as a result? Probably nothing. If a lot of other people share your views, then something bad will happen to you, but it would have happened anyway. So, <laughs> yes, key thing to keep in mind. All right, so when an individual pays a very small price for rationality, as in politics, he's gonna consume more, and actually he will do what economists call satiating. This is like when, you, when you're at an all-you-can-eat buffet, and you eat and eat and eat until you're so full that you don't want to eat another bite. Similarly, in politics, since irrationality is basically free for the individual, you can believe something that is as crazy as you want, until you get to a point where the view is so crazy where you say, I don't want anything crazier than that. All right, that's enough. I believe thing, the things are as I want, and that's enough. So my bottom line then is that far from being inconsistent with economic theory, economists should have actually been expecting a lot of people to be quite irrational about politics. This is the kind of thing that if we really had been on the ball, we would have, we would have predicted it, rather than trying to get around the obvious facts that people don't, often don't seem to be thinking very clearly about these subjects. Right? So on these issues where the marginal cost of being wrong is, is zero, then people are likely to hold some very strange views, even if the social consequences are extremely high. So, thank you. Thank you, Brian, for that uh, whirlwind tour. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, because much of Brian's uh, work uh, depends on uh, analyzing and sifting through uh, public opinion uh, analysis, we thought it would be uh, fitting to have uh, one of uh, America's uh, uh, leading experts on the measurement of public uh, opinion come and comment on his book. So today, commenting on uh, the myth of the rational voter, we have uh, Scott Keeter, who is Director of Survey Research at the Pew Research Center here in Washington, D.C. His published work includes books on political participation and civic engagement, religion and politics, public opinion in American elections, along with articles and book chapters on survey methodology, political communications, and healthcare topics. Uh, Keeter has taught at George Mason University, Rutgers, Virginia Commonwealth, um, and since 1980, he has been an election night analyst of exit polls for NBC News. 
and has served as standards chair for the American Association for Public Opinion Research. Uh, help me give a warm welcome to Scott Keeter. Thank you. Thank you, Will. And uh, thank you all for the invitation to participate today. I first met Brian uh, during my time at George Mason University and uh, went out to lunch with him. I was quickly impressed with his free-ranging mind, uh, his sense of humor, uh, tremendous intellectual curiosity, and the speed with which he speaks as well. Um, <laughs> All of those things are on lavish display in the book as well as, uh, as, as here in his remarks. Um, I suppose that the format for this kind of event requires that I would be a critic, and uh, I'll, I'll try to fulfill expectations, but I have to tell you it's, uh, it's, it takes uh, some work, and I also have mixed feelings about it. There is really a lot to like uh, in this book. I found myself in agreement with a great deal of it, and uh, impressed with a lot of it, even when I didn't necessarily agree with it. Um, I don't like the implication that um, he carefully avoids making at least too explicit in there about uh, democracy and the way a good democracy might function, or even whether democracy is, is the right uh, system uh, at, at all. But I'm not sure how seriously to, to take these implications, and uh, that might be an interesting subject for questions from the audience for him um, as, as we uh, turn to that part of the program. Um, since my substantive criticism is going to have to be rather muted, um, or at least fairly selective, let me begin with just some ad hominem attacks on him, which uh, <laughs> maybe is the best that I can do. Cheap shots that are personal rather than substantive, if, if you will. For example, what is it about that terrible wallpaper that you have on your website, Brian? Has anybody <laughs> told you how hard it makes it to read the text on yeah, there? You. They, have, they have said that, but you haven't changed it because it's the same paper, I think, that's been on there since I knew you back at GMU. <laughs> anyway. Sure. Can, Consider it a friendly suggestion. Um, and if any of you go on his website, which is a fabulous website, by the way, it's, uh, it, it's uh, so interesting and very much reflects the, um, the kind of thinking and humor that, uh, that Brian brings to his work, then I, I think you'll agree with me and you can send him an email message about the distracting quality of the <laughs> wallpaper. Um, you know, much of the, the, these ad hominems have, have got to be motivated just by pure jealousy. Um, the, the level of uh, attention paid to this book seems very unseemly for a serious uh, ac academic product. Um, and for those of us who've published scholarly books in this area, my book that uh, Brian mentioned uh, was published in 1996. Um, you know, I just think there's a lot of resentment among people like me towards Brian for getting so much attention for his work. I mean, reviews in The Economist, Louis Manon, The New York Times, The New Yorker, and, and more and more to come, I, I am sure. Um, I also considered a, a, a comment that actually did occur to me as I'm reading it, and I'm thinking, um, you know, this reminds me of the Da Vinci Code. There's a lot of hooey in here, but boy, am I learning a lot as I'm reading it. So. All right, well, I'll, I'll stop because uh, I, can't, I can't think of, of any more good jokes anyway. Um, this book is really a difficulty for the, for the critic um, to, to uh, find something to hang on to and a pleasure for the, for the reader uh, for, for this reason. Um, Brian is, has written this book like a, like a master chess player. He has anticipated what you're going to say about the next argument that he makes, and then he's anticipated the argument after that and the one after that. He's really thinking three or four steps ahead of you and has done a very good job of weaving the, 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 the counter arguments and the evidence right into the, into the argument. And that, that takes a, a fair amount of skill because it's already a fairly complicated argument that he's laying out, and so, uh, pausing it or, or at least weaving into it the likely anticipated problems that readers are going to have, um, you know, could slow it down. But um, if you've read it, you know what I'm talking about. It really breezes along. It makes some very sophisticated arguments in a, in a snappy fashion, maybe not quite as snappy as his presentation, but it very, very um, efficiently, uh, but at the same time, uh, sort of 
keeps keeps the critic uh, wondering, well, what what is it that I could say, or what is it that really undermines this because I don't like the way it feels or uh, whatever, but I can't think of the right kind of evidence to to bring to bear on it. So. Um, in, in any event, if you don't, if you haven't read it, um, you know it's a. I highly recommend it for for that reason alone. But as I say, it it, it makes my job more difficult. Um, Brian's basic thesis regarding the levels of knowledge of the of of the public um, is certainly consistent with my own work on the subject and work that I've done since uh, writing the book with Michael Deli Carpini back in 1996. And over at the Pew Research Center, we've continued to do work on this, um, essentially testing the public in terms of its knowledge of politics and public affairs. Uh, most recently, we did a poll in the spring that was really devoted almost exclusively uh, to that. And uh, for those of you who are interested in having a little bit of fun, uh, try going to pewresearch.org and look at the, um, the little section on where do you fit. There's a a, a, a thinker sitting on the on the um, pedestal and looking and what you do if you click on that is you get a chance to take a small version of the quiz and see how you compare with the national sample uh, across a, a 10 questions or so and we've had tremendous interest in that even during the surveys we found that people were really um, having fun with it uh, even if they didn't know the answers and I, I appeared on C-SPAN um, one morning and um, they had uh, they had talked about the survey and they put um, some of the questions up on the screen and then when callers called in they um, they asked them the questions on the air and then the callers would say hit me again give me another one so people liked the idea of, of taking the quiz but we've learned quite a lot about what the public knows and uh, the portrait that, that Brian paints in the book is, generally speaking, a, 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 an accurate one compared with the work that, that I've done and that the work that we're con continuing to do. Which is to say, in the words of um, Philip Converse, eminent political scientist from the University of Michigan, you know, one of the most uh, well-established truths in the social sciences and in political science in particular is that the mean level of public knowledge about politics is very low and the variance is very high. So, um, you know, typically you can find uh, relatively small percentages of people that know facts that those of us who live inside the Beltway or think about politics a lot would uh, consider to be s somewhat second nature. But you also find that there is a tremendous variability in, um, in knowledge in that um, the public is actually made up of a number of different strata uh, in terms of knowledgeability on any given type of topic. Um, in, in other words, it's not correct to say the, the, the public is, um, is ill-informed. Uh, it's correct to say that a significant segment of the public is ill-informed, but there are a lot of people that are quite knowledgeable. For example, people who vote, for the most part, are considerably more knowledgeable than those who don't. And if you narrow it down even more than that to, let's say, people who vote in off-year elections or just to, um, you know, any other sort of arbitrary segment of the public that's about a quarter or a third, um, you actually have people who are very knowledgeable. It's also the case that knowledge tends to vary across uh, topical areas. Um, in particular, we found in the poll that the Pew Research Center did this spring that um, the, the poll focused not on civics knowledge and how a bill becomes law and that type of thing, but on, on uh, questions in the news, what's going on in politics today. And the area where people showed the most impressive levels of knowledge were exactly the areas where you would expect. They were on questions having to do the, with the war in Iraq. Uh, people knew about the surge, they knew the size of the surge, um, and significant numbers, minorities, but, uh, but still significant numbers, uh, could name the Sunnis as the other branch of Islam that was involved in the, in the um, in, in inter, inter um, sort of civil war, however you want to call it, within, within Iraq. And so a, a fair amount of fairly specialized knowledge is known to a significant number of people, especially if it's um, if it uh, relates to topics that are uh, very important to people and that it's getting a lot of attention, which I, a point which I will come back to is I'll offer a few uh, gentle criticisms of the book or at least points for you to consider as you're, as you're reading it. Um, 
so he's not done any disservice to those of us who study uh, political knowledge and describes uh, the findings of others work uh, very, very honestly, and I think takes off from a point that um, have been well established in political science to make a, make a very interesting argument. But I do see a few um, uh, difficulties here that, um, again, he's anticipated many of them and he's spoken to them, but I, I think they're worth um, mentioning nonetheless. Um, one of the most obvious ones, and it has been pointed out by some of the uh, people who've reviewed his book uh, is what I would call the domain problem. It's understandable that an economist would privilege um, economic knowledge and, uh, and, and economic principles as sort of central to uh, good governance, but um, it's not so obvious that people who are experts in other fields uh, would necessarily uh, pri privilege economic uh, knowledge. And so uh, when one thinks about um, giving power to a council of economic advisors uh, as opposed to voters or in, in some way making uh, economic knowledge more of a criterion for what a good citizen is, um, I think that there's you know, there are potential objections from, from uh, not just experts in other fields, but from all of us who consider other aspects of life, even while related to economics, to be important. Um, you know, one of the examples that, that um, come to, has come to mind in my discussions with other people about the work is, uh, is health care. Now, there's obviously a connection between economics and health care and the degree to which markets would be the appropriate way to solve the American health care problem. But um, you would have, I think, a fairly large consensus among uh, many health system experts in this country that, um, you know, that there are very serious market failures with respect to the health care system in the U.S. and that, um, that, ne that a, a, a market solution um, in and of itself unfettered or in, in some other form to what we currently are facing with health care in this country uh, wouldn't necessarily be the best. I, I certainly think that uh, many economists or health economists that I know don't see that. I mean, many of them favor single-payer systems that are um, would have markets within them, but are are essentially not the kind of market system that we think of. And so, um, I'm not endorsing one policy or another. I'm just saying that I think that the the premise here is a very controversial one, and one that um, you know needs needs further defense. Um, than it necessarily gets uh, in, in the book. Foreign policy is another one. Now, it, it, Brian does do a good job in terms of treating some aspects of foreign policy, uh, the, 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 the questions especially having to do with international trade, uh, the anti-foreign bias that he identifies, um, but that's not the only kinds of questions relating to foreign policy, and not all questions really relate uh, to, to economics. Um, and we certainly have seen uh, many problems in, in the foreign policy world the past few years um, that I don't think ha are, are likely to have any sort of solution from um, the kind of substitution that he's, that he's talking about. Um, a second area is what I would call the expert agreement problem. Again, he's anticipated this, but I think that, that you, um, you can't get around the fact that there is uh, significant disagreement among experts, uh, even within the economics field. I mean, it's an old joke about the, uh, you know, the degree, of, the degree of dissensus and the kinds of different recommendations that you get among economists. Yes, you uh, have, I think, a consensus that markets are good, but as he points out, um, you know, economists have done a great job of, 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 of detailing the, the degree to which markets fail and market failures you know, are a serious problem, have to be dealt with. So in other words, once you get past some of the very basic principles, you just don't find much consensus among economists on a lot of the very questions that seem to be motivating what, what he's doing here. I mean, even in the 1996 survey of economists and, and uh, the public, you find, you, you find disagreement among economists even on the basic facts of the matter. I mean, for example, um, there was a question in the poll, are most of the new jobs being created these days good paying or low paying? Now mo most of the public thinks they're low paying, 70%, 79% say that. That could very well be an, an incorrect um, assumption. But what do the economists say? 39% say they're well paying, 32% say they're low paying, and 22% say neither are mixed. Well, 
um, th there's no consensus on the basic facts among economic professionals. Same thing in terms of whether family incomes are going up or faster or slower than um, than uh, than the than you know the inflation basically or the cost of living. Uh, no consensus among the economists. No consensus among the economists on the question of whether tax cuts are good or bad for the economy. And then, you know, on the question of whether regulation is to blame for the reason the economy might not be doing better than it is, um, more people in the public think that that's true than thought so among, among the econ economists sample. Now, none of this is fatal. It's just my point is that there's, there is less of an economic consensus out there among experts than <coughs> probably would be necessary, um, you know, to, to fully want to buy the argument that he's making. Um, let me make a final uh, point about w what I would call the static problem. There's an assumption that is not ever stated explicitly here that the public really, um, because of the irrationality of many of its views, is resistant to learning or to accepting the truth when uh, it's, it's made available to them. And while, you know, it's hard to find lots of examples on this, I think that um, there, there's, a, there's a sense from the book that the public has greater, uh, let's say, anti-trade biases than it does. I mean, keep in mind that on the question of NAFTA, after uh, Bill Clinton and Al Gore worked very hard in the early 1990s to sell NAFTA, he never got a, a gigantic consensus among the public, but he got pluralities or, or small majorities favoring NAFTA at that time. And that was partly a result of things like uh, Al Gore and, and, um, and uh, Ross Perot debating uh, some of the issues uh, on television. So there, there are, we have evidence of the fact that the public actually can be brought around to, uh, to better points of view from someone's perspective or uh, less, uh, less inaccurate points of view. Um, and I think that um, related to that is the question of whether ultimately voting, encouraging more people to vote is a good thing. There's certainly the implication from this work, or one could draw the implication from this work, that it's not a good thing um, for everybody to vote because there are a lot of people who are so uninformed or misinformed that it, it, that it does the system harm. But I think that one should also recognize the fact that when people do vote, they get additional incentives to become more um, informed. Uh, we find that people who are brought into the system, especially young people who are encouraged to go vote, find that over time, having done it, they get more interested and they're able um, to uh, inform themselves in ways that make them better voters or more rational voters um, in, in the future. All of this is simply to say that um, one has to search pretty hard to find things to disagree with uh, Brian about, at least in his diagnosis of the problem. Uh, I think there are some problems as I've, as I've outlined here. But I can guarantee you that if you, you will not, you will read this book and you will not think that you've read a book by an economist, except in a few pages there where you have a few curves. Uh, instead, I think you'll find a very lively uh, and very informative uh, tale about our current policy process and some of the problems with it. And I uh, encourage you to read it and make up your own mind. Uh if uh, Brian would like a, a couple minutes to uh, respond, uh, say three minutes. Sure, so, so, uh, sounds very good. get us going into the uh, larger <clears throat> discussion with the audience. Yes, um, so very, some very great comments from Scott. Uh, remind, uh, make, makes me think that I, should, that I should have worked harder on him to make him give me very detailed comments before I sent the book into Princeton. Uh, so on this question of the domain, I, I did make an effort to, to indicate that I'm focusing on economics because it's what I know because it seems important and because economists have been talking about economic literacy for a long time, I don't mean to say that other experts don't have some important things to contribute. I go over a couple examples in the book like uh, toxicologists for the, versus the public. Turns out that whereas toxicologists believe that dosage is important, many, many non-toxicologists think that any infinitesimal amount of a dangerous substance will kill you for sure. So, uh, and there are many other disagreements of this kind between toxicologists and the public. Uh, I, I don't talk much about foreign policy in the book, but there, I, I did, do have an op-ed that I've been shopping around on this topic. Uh, there's some very interesting uh, work in public opinion on the rally around the flag effect. Uh, this is this tendency for wars to suddenly become popular once they're declared. 
And if you think about the incentives that that gives to politicians, uh, they're, not pr they're not pretty. <laughs> and then there's a further pattern in public opinion to become disillusioned with wars a after they start, even though they are lasting and doing about as well as they should have expected all along. So that also can lead to some bad incentives for politicians to first jump the gun, go in, then, then, people, get, then people get disappointed, and then maybe leave things much worse than they were. So you know, what I actually say in the book is I would be overjoyed if experts in other fields would go and apply my argument to their fields and tell us what experts in their field know and what the public really needs to learn. I, so I, I would, 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 that would be a great, great joy to me if that happened. And if you want to do, want to do any work on this, uh, please send me your working papers or your, your manuscripts. I'd love to see it. Uh, now, now, Scott did, uh, did make a very interesting point, which I don't think I adequately emphasize in the book, which is sometimes these, diff these disagreements between the public and economists are the sort where all econ or almost all economists think one thing and the public doesn't know what it thinks, or the public is divided. But he's right, there's also a number of questions where economists are divided and the public has one, right, has one answer that they believe. I still say this should be disturbing. If brain surgeons disagree about what you've got, and, and, you, and, uh, and some guy who doesn't know anything you definitely says you definitely need to have half your brain taken out, you should be very worried about that guy. So, well, the experts don't agree. You seem to think that you've got all the, ans the answer for sure. I don't think we should be listening to you. I think it's time to wait and see. If the experts can't agree, we shouldn't just jump the gun because there's one guy who hasn't studied the subject who thinks he's got the answer. But uh, I think that's, that's a great point from Scott. I didn't emphasize enough in the book, and I should have, although I say it's still a serious problem. Uh, the last point, uh, just to chime in on uh, NAFTA. Uh, yeah, this, this, is, this is a very interesting example of uh, politics working better than you'd expect, given public opinion. So you go and you take a look at public opinion. Actually, there, were, there was very, very careful polling done during that entire year. Essentially, more people favored NAFTA than opposed it for the first time two weeks after NAFTA was passed. <laughs> and then, then support eroded again. <laughs> But it, it was true that by a very big public relations campaign, uh, uh, Clinton was temporarily able to make more people support NAFTA than opposed it. But I would still say this is not any great grounds for optimism on the part of the public, because remember, you know, how long did NAFTA have to be? You know, a thousand pages long? Right. So you know, how, how much work is it to actually get free trade when a real free trade treaty would just be a sentence? There's now free trade between the US and Mexico. Uh, and also worth pointing out, there's, we, there's still a very long way to go. Even if we had a thousand page treaty for every remaining country where we still have high tariff barriers with, that would be a lot of thousand page treaties. And so, you know, you know this, this reminds me of uh, one of the main comments that the reviewer in the Wall Street Journal had saying, look, very few bad things have happened in recent years. And I was thinking, well, very few things have happened in recent years. <laughs> right? you know, you know, basically, the status quo is very hard to change in the US. Uh, you know about gridlock. And therefore, it's not so surprising if no new bad things happen because new things generally don't happen. Um, so, that, so, uh, so, so the key thing to keep in mind is, the level, is to understanding the levels. Why is policy basically the way that it is? It may be that we're able to get, get some improvement reform. And of course, one of the main reasons why I wrote the book is because I'd like to try to slightly increase the chance of improvement reform. And, you know, I think you know, step one of getting some improvement reform is convincing people that they might be wrong. Thank you. Well, uh, now we will open uh, the discussion up to uh, you, the members of the audience. Uh, uh, a few guidelines for your questions. Uh, we have microphones that uh, wander the floor. Please wait for the microphone to come to you. Uh, please identify yourself and your organization uh, if you have an affiliation. And please do uh, try to limit your remarks to a question and uh, not, not a soliloquy. Uh, all right, so uh, we have a hand uh, right here, this gentleman right here in the first row. Wouldn't you agree that the main purpose of democracy is not to make good policy, but to ensure the peaceful transition of power between interests? Hmm. I mean, I say, uh, you know, in, in, most, uh, mo in, in most Western countries, there isn't much of an issue of civil war breaking out either way. Uh, there isn't, you know, it's not, that's not a serious concern. I'd say that uh, picking policy is at least one of the very important things that's going on. I mean, maybe you're thinking that policies are going to be the same regardless uh, of, of, of who's in charge. I'd say that's, that's uh, you know, probably not so, or a better way of thinking about it is that if public opinion changed, policy would change. Uh, there is a reason why... Uh, competing politicians tend to agree so much, which is that they're both competing for the median voter or for the swing voter. So naturally, they're trying to go and tell the swing voter what he wants to hear. Uh, but uh, you know, if that swing voter were to change his mind, then uh, what politicians are saying would be likely to change. Uh, now, I mean, one, one thing that you, that you might be getting at, I'm not sure, is that 
Uh, really what politicians try to do is just to stay in office, and the way they do that isn't by implementing particular policies, but just by, but just by trying to get peace and prosperity. I think this is one of the reasons why things are not a lot worse. Right? So if politicians were to actually do exactly what public opinion says they should do, it would be a disaster, and everyone would hate the politician who did it. Uh, see the case of Gray Davis. Uh, so, uh, what I would say, though, is while you know, you know, while policy is no, is, while while uh, to some extent uh, voters do vote just on peace and prosperity, and that does help make the system work better, still uh, peace and prosperity uh, brought about with extremely unpopular policies is generally still not going to lead to re-election. If you could cut the crime rate in half by legalizing drugs, uh, would a politician who did that be seen as a hero or as the biggest monster of the modern era? I have a feeling it would be the second, although I wish it were the first. My name is Glenn Coryell, and uh, I'm an old turkey. But in uh, any case, though, uh, I do, I am uh, active as a poll worker in uh, Louisville, Kentucky, and deep concern over the low percentage of registered voters who actually vote. And of course, to me, it's not just a right to vote, but it's a responsibility to vote. And my questions are these. One, how can we uh, get more registered voters, in fact, to vote? And two, how can we help them be more knowledgeable about the issues that, are, that differ between, say, two candidates in each of the levels, whether it's local, state, or federal, so that they can therefore be more responsible in their voting. You want to take that first, Scott? Let me, let me address the, um, the, the first part. Um, we have observed in this country uh, over the last 30 years a, um, a stagnation in the voter, voter turnout rate. It's not a decline, as many people have said. There actually is um, factoring out some of the ups and downs, like the, the spike in 2004 and in 1992. There has actually been no change. This is discouraging, however, given the fact that um, things that predict voting, such as educational levels, have been rising steadily since the 1970s. Um, it seems that the best arguments for why this stagnation has occurred, even as um, other factors, um, proliferation of news media and, um, ri and a rise in the levels of formal education, uh, why that hasn't helped uh, raise the level of voting has to do with the, with the decline in mobilization of voters. Um, the one group in which uh, we have seen a decline is among young people, and 2004 presented an interesting um, experiment, if you will, in whether mobilization of voters could really make a difference. Um, in 2004, we saw the biggest percentage increase in voter turnout among young people that we have seen in this modern period that I'm talking about, basically since the 1970s. And I would argue that is largely because not only did you have an exciting election in which everybody agreed a lot was at stake, but you also had massive efforts on the part of both political organizations and nonprofit organizations to mobilize young people. I would argue that what's happened over this period of time is that there has been a decline in the um, in the various institutions, labor unions and others, that actually engage in mobilization. And what has happened is that you have gotten uh, progressively a, a, a more elite group of people voting. Now, the elite group has grown because of the growth in formal education, but it has increasingly left uh, people who are not college educated and are not uh, affluent uh, behind because they're not being asked uh, to, to turn out in the culture. So my, my quick answer to the question would be we need to find other ways to, to mobilize people. Uh, we need to find other institutions that will ask people to vote. And part of it is the, the political parties and the candidates themselves. The targeting of voters has become so efficient um, and so carefully done in terms of making sure that you only mobilize the people who are in agreement with you that the, the, the 
the electorate can be narrowed to people that are dependable and mobilized, leaving the rest of the people out. So it's a, it's a, it's a continuation of a trend that has a lot of different sources. Brian, is low turnout even a bad thing, uh, according to your thesis? No. <laughs> uh, yes, this, this is where you're going to see that I am an economist and not a political scientist. Uh, my, my claim in the book is actually that low voter turnout is a blessing in disguise. The key, one, of the, one of the two key things that predicts turnout is actually higher education, and, higher edu and more educated people generally have more sensible views about policy. So I think part of the reason why policy is not worse is that we are, uh, is that people who know less about what, about what makes sense are less likely to actually influence policy. So, you know, and now on the question of could we, pay, could we take more efforts in order to educate voters more, well, this is where I'll be an economist and say, if you have two different ways of doing the same thing, and one is much cheaper than the other, you should do the cheaper one. So if you could either encourage people who don't know what they're doing to not vote, or at least not encourage them to vote, or you could have a massive public education campaign to raise the level of awareness of everyone up to the level of a PhD, if, if there are even such resources in the universe, I think it's better to just encourage, encourage people to be lazy. So, you know, if you don't really know what's going on, uh, it would actually be the more responsible thing not to participate. Uh, Greg Mankey on his blog posted an op-ed, which is the, it, it, was, it was the one column that he, that he ever wrote for a magazine. I don't remember the magazine, but it was the one column he ever wrote where they turned it down. They said, sorry, we're not running this column, Greg. And it was his column where he said, if, if, you, if, you, are, if you are an uninformed voter, it would be a, a service to all of us if perhaps you would just stay home. And I think, it, I th I think this is a point, while shocking, uh, there is deep wisdom in it. Okay, next. I did describe this book as provocative on the back cover. <laughs> I believe this gentleman uh, here has had his hand up, and then after that, this uh, woman in the black down here, if you want to. Bruce Britton at the uh, University of Georgia, from the University of Georgia. The trend in the U.S. and the other democracies has been to more and more insulation from the voter, less decided by the House and more by the th Federal Reserve, the FCC, SEC, FDA, the longer terms, the Base Closing Commission and, and the ju Federal Judiciary and the Civil Service, which are lifetime tenure. Uh, the consequence is that we have more and more government power and also more and more uh, higher living standards and um, well-being and so on. Uh, are you proposing that we should have more government, more insulation from the voter by means of more government power of, of longer term entities or that we should devolve the power outside the government to the private sector? Right, yes. Uh, first, first choice, yes, is <clears throat> well, when, when possible, leave more things to the market. So ab absolutely, that is my first choice. And there's a lot of cases where it could work very easily with minimal effort. Uh, in other cases where that's not going to happen, then I at least think we should be open to the possibility that experts would do a better job. Take the case of, uh, of the Federal Reserve. I think at least it does a much better job than it would if they were popularly elected. I think we would have um, uh, significantly higher inflation and unemployment would probably be about the same. So I think, I think le le we should at least be open to the idea that, uh, that uh, experts do actually do things better. Uh, so I, I, so uh, again, that is, that is not my first choice, but it's something uh, as a second best, it's worth considering. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Julie Abrahams. I'm here as a member of the public. Um, I wonder if you could comment a little bit about the um, the um, special interests uh, theory, because um, your, your argument, to the extent that I understand it, seems very compelling. But before I was acquainted with your argument, the story that people usually tell about problems is that there are special interests who care a lot, and most other people don't care very much, so the special interests dominate a policy decision. Yeah, that is a great question. This is one of the questions that actually made me write the book, because whenever I was around other economists, they would always say, say things like, you know why we have Social Security, don't you? No. We have it because old people vote so much. Right? And they're a special interest. And I say, hmm, that's an interesting theory. Well, let's go and take a look at the data. Turns out that Social Security is overwhelmingly popular in all age levels. And in fact, it's slightly less popular among the elderly, believe it or not. Yes, the elderly overwhelmingly support it. The young overwhelmingly support it by a little more. And this pattern can be repeated for virtually every kind of major special interest policy that, we, that uh, you can think about. Uh, farm subsidies, very widely blamed on the farmers. The farmers are the ones who force these policies down our throat. If you go and look at public opinion, it turns out that you have about 80% support for farm subsidies in farm and non-farm states alike. And then, well, why do people want farm subsidies? Well, uh, one, one, of the, one of the arguments that appeals most to the general public is we need farm subsidies in order to assure that we have food. 
I do not kid you. 60% of Americans will say that we need farm subsidies to make sure that the groceries have food in them, even though, of course, almost none of the items in the, store, in the grocery store are subsidized. It's only a handful of those items are subsidized, and they, see, they, appear to be, they were there the last time I checked. But uh, yeah, so uh, I, I actually had an op-ed on this in the Wall Street Journal just going over how economists tend to blame special interests, but, but in general, these policies of special interests are getting are, are, are popular, which perhaps explains why politicians hold a big press conference when they impose a steel tariff, rather than saying, let's keep this quiet, because they know people will like them more for imposing the steel tariff, not less. Of course, I, I, I f found it interesting that you referred to the entire public as a special interest when talking about Social Security. I know, the, just the elderly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, so. All right, let, let's uh, look for one back here the, in the uh, pink shirt right there. Or is that salmon? I don't know. <laughs> Um, my name is Karen Bentley, and I'm with a group called The Polling Company, and my question is for Dr. Kaplan. Um, you talked about voters' key issues, and with regards to public opinion data and what you defined as technically non-economic issues, like Iraq and the war on terror, um, do you think that deep down those issues are, um, are economic issues, and have you done any analysis um, on economists' outlook on Iraq um, versus the public, and particularly like on domestic economic security? That's, that's a very good question. Informally, I've noticed that at least for, for a while, economists, economists tend, to be, tend to be hawkish, which I am not. I think, I think a lot of it comes from a misapplication of the idea of incentives matter, saying, look, incentives matter, so therefore we should strike the fear of God into everyone else on earth, and then they will do what we want. And this is, and the, yes, but they also might hate you for it, and then things might not work out as well as you're expecting. Uh, you know, I mean, I, I would like to see a lot more done on, uh, you know, on, on foreign policy and uh, applying what I've done in this book. The main things that I've seen, like I said, are this work on the rally around the flag effect. There's a, a great book by John Mueller on overblown on how people overestimate the risks of terrorism. So I think there are. I think the argument that I'm making in the book really does go through for a lot of other issues. I think, I think we, you know, we are uh, putting way too much effort into fighting terrorism, which is statistically a small problem. Again, just to just to offend the people that I haven't offended so far, I'll now offend them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, but. Um, but yes, I mean, I'd li I like more to be done. I'd like to, have, I'd like to have more answers to your questions, but so far I don't, but I hope to get them. Did you have a? No. All right. Uh... Bill Niskanen, the Cato Institute. Uh, Professor Kaplan, you attribute the irrational policies of democracies to irrational voters. Now, how do you explain the substantial difference in economic policies among democracies both over time and at any given time among governments? Yeah, that's a very good question. This is something where I don't have the data, but I'll tell you my belief. <laughs> I'll tell you my guess. I believe that levels of rationality vary from country to country and time to time. I believe that the level of economic irrationality in France is greater than in the US, and that is why they make it very difficult to fire someone, uh, even though the long-run consequence of this, as almost any economist will tell you, is to make employers very reluctant to hire. And similarly, I think it varies over time. I think economic irrationality in the 1930s was much worse in the US than it is today. I and mean, when you go and read the history of the 1930s and see what people would say, it's horrifying. It's horrifying to see what people would say. Um, although, actually, the, one, the, 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 the statement that sticks in my mind the most is perhaps the most horrifying is what Herbert Hoover said in 1932 at, I think, the, nom the nominating convention. When, uh, when unemployment was 25%, he said, yes, it's true that unemployment is 25%, but let it not be forgotten that there's also good news. Our wages are now the highest in the world, never considering that perhaps the 25% unemployment rate could be related to the 25% rise in real wages during, during the first three years of the Great Depression. And he got thunderous applause. So uh, <laughs> when, when I hear that, I'm like, oh, gee, uh, I don't think things would be that bad today. So I think that things actually were worse at, the, at uh, in previous times. Uh, the, date, the, the, there's, there's very, the, the data, the data is not good. The data is not good. Again, I, I will say that I've got that we have a lot of anecdotal evidence, and uh, there are there are surveys saying that things like uh, you know support for labor market regulation of, of a European kind is much more common in Europe than it is here. So I think that's clear. Uh, but uh, yeah, again, you know, uh, if someone would like to give me the money to go and do the international version of the survey, I would love to accept the money and do it. And if someone wants, to, can someone configure, you know, someone can invent a time machine where you can go back and ask people their views back in the 30s. Uh, I'd really like to do that. Uh, but you know, again, again, not, and I don't mean to be flippant. If you have some idea of how we could actually measure public opinion back then, I'd like to get it. But uh, you know, you work with what you've got. <laughs>
I'd like to actually ask you a follow-up question on that. The, the, your your uh, theory uh, depends on the idea that the uh, uh, that that rationality is a good, like many others, and and people will uh, be more or less rational depending on the cost of being rational. Uh, if we've seen a change over time since the 30s, where there's a difference in the U.S. as opposed to, say, France, uh, what what is explaining those differences in costs such that people now are are more likely to exercise rationality economically in terms of economic policy than before? Yes, uh, my best answer is slightly circular, although it's not entirely circular. Uh, so I don't don't have time to go over the game theory of coordination games, but. For an individual, you know, but basically, the, you know, the main cost of having certain views, uh, you know, uh, is often just that other people won't like you if you have them. So if you live in a country where most people have pretty reasonable views and you don't, there's going to be social pressure on you to change your mind. On the other hand, if you live in a country where irrational views are extremely popular, there's social pressure on you to be irrational. So in terms of why any particular individual living in a country tends to have, have views of one kind or another, I will I will give the answer, which is not entirely circular, which is people think that because other people around them think that. It may seem circular, but it's not actually. However, the deeper question of, yeah, but why do a lot of people in that country think that? That, I just have to appeal to history, differences in culture. Uh, if someone has a better story, I'd like to hear it, but I don't have one. All right, uh, let's go with uh, this gentleman uh, right here. He's had his hand up, uh, and this guy in the black after that. Hi, I'm uh, Carl Johnston from uh, George Mason. Hey, Carl. Former students. Um, I was, I was hoping you would address yourself a little bit more to a piece of Scott's uh, uh, commentary, which was about health care. Mm -hmm. And he pointed out, and my experience in the field also uh, finds this, that the consensus among health care experts, the people that you would have uh, running things, uh, is uh, more along the lines of uh, non-market solutions to health care problems and towards single-payer systems mm -hmm. and so forth. And um, I'm, I'm just wondering if, uh, A, you think perhaps that indicates that maybe they're right, or B, uh, uh, was uh, Hillary Clinton correct in her approach, at least, when she took a bunch of experts and, and uh, walked them off into a back room and, and had them cook up a plan uh, that, that uh, pretty much bombed when it came out in 1994? Uh, yes, uh, very, 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 very fair question. Uh, so, for, you know, uh, just to take the, the easiest one, does the fact that most health care experts think something make me think they might be right? Yes. Yes, it does. It's something that I think you have to take seriously. When people who have studied a subject for a long time have a view, at least you've got to take a deep breath and say, all right, let, let's hear what they have to say. I, I don't think it's a very, I think it is unwise to dismiss uh, a, a consensus like that without further study. Uh, what I would say is, I, I would hypothesize that a lot of a lot, a lot of the disagreement between, uh, or a lot, a lot of the views of healthcare specialists, uh, comes comes uh, in, in substantial part uh, down to ideology, right? Where I, I suspect, although I'm not confident, but I suspect that you really will see a very strong liberal democratic overrepresentation among healthcare experts. And if you were to look at healthcare experts who are politically non-aligned, I think that you would see a, a much more circumspect view of things. Uh, so I, I think, think think that's part of the story. Uh, you know, there is this question of domain. So, healthcare experts, what exactly are they are experts about? Uh, they may be experts about the, uh, for example, the you know, the health benefits of various procedures. They may not be health. They, they may, in fact, not be experts about the most efficient way to allocate. And in fact, what you what you will see among many healthcare experts is they just don't like cost benefit analysis. So, in that case, I'd say, well, it's not that they're not experts, but they're experts about something more narrow than all healthcare. Right? So, that's something that I would add. Uh, this fellow here, and then we'll go into the back uh, for a couple questions. Hi, my name is uh, Ryan from GMU. I got probably more of an academic question. You compared Kaplan's book to uh, that of Downs, Tulloch, and, and Buchanan, and I was wondering how the orthodox uh, PCers, the public choicers, have viewed your idea of, uh, of, of irrationality as opposed to rational ignorance. And it, it's of course, it hasn't been enough time, but mm -hmm. what have you uh, gotten feedback yet? Well, actually, there has been enough time because I've been haranguing people for 10 years. So, <laughs> uh, so I'd say in terms of the actual data, there's not much disagreement. A lot of it is much more philosophical about you know, what does it really mean to be ignorant? What does it really mean to be irrational? I would say that probably the main source of disagreement comes from 
the fact that it's very hard for people in public choice to abandon this view that voters are selfish and vote selfishly, which again, one thing that I've learned from political scientists like Scott is the data is overwhelmingly against the selfish voter voting hypothesis. In fact, it is very hard to predict someone's political views based upon their objective self-interest. And this is an idea that's very hard to talk people out of. But uh, you know, personally, uh, they've been great. And of course, they gave me tenure, so that says something. <laughs> I had a, can, can I exercise speaker's prerogative and a ask you a question? Brian, I'm, ver I'm curious what you make of something that gets remarked on, upon a lot uh, by people in my business now, which is the fact that you still have uh, a third to 40 percent of the U.S. public believing that Saddam Hussein was involved in the 9-11 attacks. Um, is this the um, supply side of irrationality? Uh, that you write about in the book is it a is this a is this a something uh, apart from whether it's true or not or whether it is uh, a problem for our foreign policy? Um, what's the source of it, and how do you how do you what sense do you make of it in your framework? Right. So, uh, forty percent of people thinking that, or forty percent of Americans thinking that Saddam was behind the uh, the World Trade Center attacks. Well, uh, now this is not the kind of belief that someone forms in a vacuum, right? This is not something that you have a gut feeling about when you're five. So I'd say that the you know, supply side was supply side was important in terms of spreading this message. However, you know, there, there's what I call joint causation here, right? Uh, you know, you know, people would not have would not have been promoting this idea if people would have thrown tomatoes at them or said, "You're going to say stuff like that. I'm not going to. I don't trust you anymore." So you know, I, th I think basically what's going on here is you have an interaction between people who are extreme, who are very credulous. People who, want, people who have some people that they want to believe and basically ascribe some kind of infallibility to them or at least some unreasonable level of trust, combined with people who, would, who, who want to go and sell the story in order to cover themselves. So I, I, I think you know, this, this is a case where you know, I think there is, is an important interaction. You can, bl you can go and blame, say, conservative radio. But again, it wouldn't be on conservative radio if people didn't like, didn't like what they were hearing. So I think there's complex interaction. Although ultimately, you know, if people were more reasonable about this, there wouldn't be much of a market for, for the supply side to be spreading it. So. And a number of hands up in the back there. Uh, this gentleman in the, in the white with a red tie. Oh, school. <clears throat> Brian, I want to press you a little further on the issue of which experts to believe and which not to. Seems to me, if you're talking about the principles of physics, I want a bunch of expert physicists uh, that I can rely on, not public opinion. On the other hand, if it comes to the question of how to interpret the Commerce Clause, uh, I would take ten people just reading it over mm -hmm. ten constitutional law professors, uh, of which I am one. Uh, and I think if you survey constitutional law professors, you get nothing other than the personal political preferences of mm -hmm. constitutional law professors. Economics strikes me as somewhere in between uh, physicists and law professors with quasi-scientific basis, shall we say, and some ability to test theses. So you have some theory as to when it's appropriate to rely on experts and when experts are going to be no better and sometimes worse than just public opinion mm -hmm. itself would be? Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, thank you, thank you very much for that question, David. So, uh, step one is I would actually go and apply the same challenges to other fields that were that have been applied to economists, namely self-serving bias and ideological bias, right? Are you know is it in fact the case the law professor actually uh, you, know, you, know, you know could it be that his income and uh, income and tenure wind up making him inclined to these views? That's not so plausible. But ideological bias, on the other hand, very plausible for law professors. Law professors, as we know, are an extremely liberal democratic group. And I, I, it would be more interesting to me to see what does a politically independent, um, ideolo ideolo ideo ideologically neutral law professor think about the Commerce Clause rather than the, rather than the typical professor, rather the typical law professor. So I'd say, let's start by just applying this ideological bias test. I think it would actually explain away a lot of, the, uh, of law professors' apparent views about the Commerce Clause. Uh, so you know, I'd say that is uh, step one, is just uh, saying, look, I've only, I only said presumption. I didn't say I really believe them. I, so let, let's go and apply the test, see how well they wind up doing. I think that that would wind up diminishing the difference by quite a bit. Uh, so, and, th and then you know, the, the second thing is, um, again, it's only presumption. If you, go into, if you go into the field and study it for a while and you start to think, it does, really does seem like this is a, like this is a big cult. Uh, well, in that case, again, uh, may, um, you know, may, 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 may be wrong, but at least it's something to consider. Do you see cult-like properties in the, in the field? Economists have also, of course, have also, of course, been accused of being a cult. But here I will go and point out, gee, you can do extremely well in this cult while spitting in the face of the cult. So it's not that much of a cult. Uh, there, there, there was the piece in the New York Times uh, last week about iconoclastic economists who have questioned uh, the free market, uh, free market fundamentalism. 
Uh, well, yeah, well, these guys are some of the most prominent uh, economists in the field. They've won the Clark Prize uh, <laughs> and so on. So it doesn't look like much of a cult uh, on that end to me. And, uh, any more questions? Uh, gentleman in the back there. Is it possible for a, uh, a layman or a non-economist to, to vote rationally? I mean, since one party has their economists and the other party has their economists, how can a layperson decide which is the correct economist and what the actual consensus of economists is if they don't know the literature, if they don't have time to put into the finding out? Hmm. I'd say one good heuristic is to find out what the economists from both parties agree on. So the stuff that they, the stuff that they disagree on, uh, it, 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 it's, it's, there, there's there's some serious questions there. The stuff where they, the stuff where they actually are able to agree, right? And uh, you know, again, this takes a little bit more work, but also the stuff where politicians distance themselves from their advisors, uh, as again the case of uh, Greg Mankiw and Mitt Romney on immigration. That's a good. That's again, that's a sign. Hmm. Uh, this is something where an where economist was willing to stick his neck out and say something different from what the guy that he's supposed to be supporting said. So that, again, seems like a good reason to think that he actually would be professionally embarrassed to go along with the guy that he's working for. So again, uh, now, again, you know, the simplest heuristic of all, uh, and one that I think would actually improve the world a lot, is just for people who cannot, who don't have the time to figure something out to be agnostic. If you don't have the time to figure out the arguments about free, free, free trade versus protection, stop having an, stop having an opinion. And if all the people who had not studied the subject stopped having an opinion, then Lou Dobbs would go away. <laughs> and politicians would then be, be appealing to, to two groups of people. People who have no opinion about free trade, and therefore it doesn't matter what they say doesn't matter, and people who know something about it, and then politicians would say free trade. All right, let's uh, make this one right here the last question. Thank you. Hi, my name is Tim Shoji. I'm from Georgetown University. Uh, my question is about something called enlightened public. Mm -hmm. um, the survey seems to suggest that the more education you receive, the more you tend to agree with economists. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of curious about that because from my personal experience, it seems like the kind of education you receive has a great uh, effect on your economic views. For example, I have a lot of friends that have multiple degrees, but mm -hmm. they all suffer from all four of the biases that you talk about. So. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering that's why that's not reflecting the data, or maybe it just have the wrong kinds of friends. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes uh, that, that is a great question, uh, and there are you know, two basic answers to that. Uh, one of them is you, if you think that well-educated people still have some appalling, appalling, appallingly economically illiterate views, you ought to see what other people look like. Right? So if you think that uh, your friends who went to college ought to know better, uh, they probably do know better compared to someone who dropped out of high school. Right? So that, that's one step. Now, the other thing is that uh, the people who, uh, highly educated people who hang around universities, such as college professors, are not a representative sample. In general, if you are highly educated and uh, extremely anti-market, you're likely to hang around universities. And so the uh, professors are a, are, are a self-selected group of highly educated people. If you go and do a broader sample of just highly educated people in general, you'll see that there's a lot of people who, uh, in fact, most people who are well-educated are relatively pro-market, but, they, but they're not the ones who stay in universities and educate our kids. Except at George Mason. <laughs> and a few right. other places. All right, well, I want to thank uh, Brian and Scott for a uh, stimulating conversation.